Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I would briefly revisit my discussion of postcolonialism as a field of study. Now, I had recorded a conversation about postcolonialism and postcolonial studies about one year ago, and it's still available. And about 15,000 people have watched it. But when I recorded that video, first of all, I was not really equipped to record a good video. But two, I didn't have a general idea of what people's expectations of postcolonial studies or a conversation explaining postcolonial studies were. Now, after having seen your comments, after having interacted with you through several webinars, I am more acutely attuned to what do people expect from an explanation of postcolonial studies and what kind of pre-established ideas and notions do they bring to it. So in this brief overview of postcolonial studies, I will first kind of explain my understanding of the field of study, how it is defined by different scholars, who are some of the people who have written good books about it, and then also incorporate certain critiques of postcolonial studies and where do they come from. And then towards the end, I will also try to explain how the field is ever moving and ever growing and ever expanding and why. So this is partly my mission in this conversation and I hope it proves useful to you. So first of all, postcolonialism as a field of study. It was introduced in the English departments first in the United States and also in Australia, Canada, and United Kingdom, but predominantly in the United States. And that's how it emerges in the 1990s or late 1980s as a particular field of study. And what it involves at that time is studies of literatures from the so-called third world or developing world, but with a certain focus on the colonial experience itself. Now, the colonialism that post-colonial studies deals with is not the early pre-capitalistic mercantile colonialism. Most of the times when we invoke the term colonialism or write about it, we are mostly focusing on 19th and 20th century colonialism. And the reason behind that is that post-colonialism as a field of study focuses primarily on the rise of colonialism after the rise of capital, because both are sort of deeply connected. Now remember, most of the colonies were meant to provide raw materials for the rising industry in the West, especially England and France. So that's one main distinction about post-colonial studies. Now, Keep in mind, as I mentioned in my earlier conversation on this topic, that the post in post-colonialism doesn't necessarily mean that the colonialism has ended or that imperialism has ended. We all know that in certain parts of the world, internal colonialism still exists. Certain parts of the world st are still under direct control of powerful nations or powerful constituencies. Post-colonialism, therefore, is an imperfect term. And in my previous conversation about post-colonialism, I had used Robert Young's very apt and succinct definition of the term. And what he says is, and I'm going to just paraphrase, is that any a body of literature or uh, cultural studies or post-colonial studies deals with the experience of colonialism, both in its contact phase, when certain parts of the world are actually colonized, tracks the resistances to it coming from native cultures and native people, 
and then goes on to write about or research about what happens after the colonizers are kicked out and these nations in Africa and Asia become independent nation states. Then also there is another strain in it, and that is people who go and retrieve pre-colonial histories and literatures. And so roughly speaking, it still sort of centers the colonial experience because of its centrality to the world history, but it doesn't just dwell on the contact phase or what happens after colonialism, but people also go and retrieve what happened before that. So in that sense, post-colonialism deals with all the three phases, pre-colonial, the contact phase, and the post-colonial phase. That's roughly what we do. Now, going over to whether or not the, it's OK just to centralize the colonial experience, and that is one of the major critiques of post-colonial studies and it comes both from the right as well as from the left, is that giving colonialism a defining place in the history of post-colonial nation states or nations is problematic because what it might end up suggesting that they had no history other than colonialism. And I think if you study more and more into post-colonial studies, its theory and praxis, you will realize that none of us posits the colonial experience as the only central experience. The point is to see what kind of resistances develop, what kind of impact does this exchange, this non-equal or unequal exchange generates, and what do people do during the colonial phase and in the post-colonial phase. Now, another distinction that we need to make and which is really crucial is to differentiate between the occupational colonialism and settler colonialism. So occupational colonialism, of course, was co colonialism where colonies were only meant as these spaces from where raw materials and labor could be extracted and transported to the metropolitan cultures. The settler colonies were the colonies where the European settlers actually came in and supplanted or replaced or sidelined the native population and then developed their own cultures and nations. United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, these are some of the examples of settler colonialism. And there is a huge field of study now which is called settler colonial studies. It has its own journals, its own scholars, and they study the history and practices of settler colonialism. In post-colonial studies then, let's just keep in mind that we don't consider that colonialism and imperialism is over. And two, we rely on works produced by native scholars, works produced by even European scholars to understand the colonial experience and resistances to it. I will slightly elaborate a little more about the field later, but here going over to if you were to read a few books which explain what post-colonialism is as a field of study, there are three books I will recommend. I would strongly recommend that you should read Robert Young's huge book, which is called Postcolonialism, A History, or Leela Gandhi's book on postcolonial theory. And the most important for me, because I've used it in my classes, is Ania Lumba's Colonialism, Postcolonialism. These are three really good books that, in one way or the other, explain post-colonialism as a field of study and give us ideas about how to go about doing our research and teaching post-colonialism. I'll post the links to those in description. Now, I will now move on to talk a little bit about some of the major critiques that were and are still mounted against post-colonialism and see where they figure in our understanding of post-colonial studies. So as the field was emerging in the 1980s and 1990s, 
There were quite a lot of critiques of post-colonial studies, and I have about three separate conversations on at least three published essays by leading scholars, R.F. Derlick, and McClintock, Ella Shohat. All of these people question whether or not post-colonialism is radical enough, whether or not it is trying to replace what was the third world intellectualism, third world writing, which, let's say, for people like R.F. Derlick, is more important than the cultural studies emphasis of post-colonial studies. And all three of them also question the, quest the post in post-colonialism. And I highly recommend that you should read those three articles just to understand how people on the left even have criticized the tendencies in early post-colonial studies. Then, of course, there are works that are conservative, and you can look them up, and they come from the right, and they are the ones who basically either try to suggest that colonialism was good, that what post-colonialism scholars do is just make a fetish out of colonialism. And you can read them just to be familiar with, you know, what people who are conservative think about our work and about this kind of work. And, and racial theory and ideology plays a lot of role in it. Then there are informal criticisms that come from our own colleagues wherever we work. These are people who either work with established subdisciplines of English or are wary of political scholarship. So for them, then, what they usually tell us is that our scholarship is not good enough, it's too political, or even the question of why do we have so many books from so many different parts of the world under one rubric of post-colonial studies, what's the justification for that? So most of the times, those critiques come from a place of insecurity or from a place where people have a certain deeply conservative idea of what constitutes English literary studies. Now, I also get quite a few questions from India and Pakistan and elsewhere. And since I'm aware of the educational system, at least in Pakistan and somewhat in India, and the questions are usually people looking for more precise definitions of post-colonialism. And I'm always deeply reluctant to give a precise ex definition because the idea is to keep the field as fluid and as wide as possible. And so reducing it to one or two or three sentences, I don't think so that serves the purpose. Another big critique that was mobilized by Walter Manwolo in one of his books, The Darker Side of Modernity, where he discusses post-colonialism and its Eurocentricity, is also an interesting critique, but we need to read it with the kind of nuance and sophistication in which Walter Manwolo actually mounts that critique. Now, what he imagines is that most post-colonial scholars are too deeply entrenched in Western theory, Derrida, Foucault, linguistics. And what his argument then is that since we are relying so much on Western modes of thinking, the reason developed in the West, we cannot break away from it to think the world differently. And that is why he proposed proposes decolonial studies. Now, decolonial studies is not a sort of nativism. It's not that we're not going to study English or we're not going to study uh, English literature. It is going and seeking different modes of being. What different cosmologies exist? Is there an alternative to the kind of reason, instrumental logic, that is the integral part of capitalism? Right? So to me, that is in itself another facet of post-colonial studies. One thing that we must not do in post-colonial studies is to develop this binaristic view, East and West. Those are very simple binaries. For me, the most productive space in any kind of thought, but especially for post-colonial studies, and that comes across to you from work of Homi Baba, even Gayatri Spivak, even Edward Said, is to look for the most productive middle where we can use the best of this word and the best of our own native cultures 
and create a kind of thought that is revolutionary, that is informed of the debates of the Western reason, if we can call it that, but also of the debates of our native culture and see how one challenges the other and maybe something new comes through that experience. And I think that would be a more hybrid and a more productive decolonial mode of thinking. So that takes me to who we ought to read if we want to develop a certain expertise in post-colonial studies. Now, I have a full list of fictional and theoretical works that is on my website, and I'll post the link to it in the description, and you can just look through what my graduate students read to become scholars of post-colonial studies. But of course, if you really want an understanding of where does the post-colonial thought come from other than reading Marx and Foucault and Derrida and everyone else, obviously I would recommend that you should read Edward Said's work, Franz Fanon, right? Homi Baba, Gayatri Spivak, Robert Young, Partha Chatterjee, the Subaltern Studies Group. I mean, the choices are endless, but the three main leading scholars are Edward Said, Homi Baba, and Gayatri Spivak. They come to it from three different perspectives. And then an understanding of Robert Young, because he is the one who uses Marxism to explain post-colonial studies. These would be some good beginning points. But as I said, the field is not settled. It doesn't have a simple definition. So you will have to pick and choose which region, which literary tradition, which theoretical tradition do you want to develop an expertise in and then write in and teach in. Now beyond that, also keep in mind that as the bodies of knowledge develop around post-colonial studies, around economics, around social studies, we incorporate those knowledges. So post-colonial studies obviously has a, a wonderful feminist strain, right? People like Chandra Mohanty and others who write about third world and post-colonial feminism, Laila Abu Lugat, right? Miriam Cook. These are some of the people who have gone into that direction. Within that, then, there is eco-feminism. Eco-criticism has also now been incorporated in the field of post-colonial studies. Then there are traditional culturalist scholars who just look at the artifact, a body of work, and talk about it in cultural sense. If you go to Africa, you will encounter a wide array of opinions, starting from Chin Wei Zhu, Dongugi Tiango, Chinua Achebe, all of them then approach their colonial experience, their post-colonial experience, and then approach how to write about that experience. So depending on who you read and whose opinions you agree with will then shape your own understanding of post-colonial studies and your understanding of post-colonialism. What I would highly recommend is to read the three books that I talked about because they give you the basic debates and basic subject matter that post-colonialism deals with. And then go on to see if you live in a post-colony, if you live in a culture or country that was colonized or is currently colonized, and you can go on and see what kind of literature, what kind of art, what kind of public scholarship is being produced about that experience. How do people come together and mobilize against it? Now, another branch of post-colonial studies is the one that also deals with neoliberal globalization and its impact on the post-colonial nations and nation states. And you can, of course, go into that as well. I just recently finalized an essay on Rohinton Mysteries, A Fine Balance, which I read as a novel that could be a good didactic tool to teach ourselves and our students the impact of neoliberal globalization on the former colonies like India and Pakistan and elsewhere. So that's another area that you can explore. So overall, where the field is headed 
is of course towards incorporating more and more knowledge as it is developed of economic theory, of social theory, of gender studies, feminist studies, eco-criticism, and it keeps incorporating that knowledge within the body of work which could be loosely called post-colonialism. One thing that the field does brilliantly, especially for those of us who live over here, is that it gives us the ability to use our own cultural knowledge, which we bring from home, right? But without becoming the so-called cultural informants, the idea is not to proffer our wares to the metropolitan audiences so that we can succeed, but the idea is to complicate the normative drive of English departments with our knowledge and our understanding. And I think that's one of the best things that you can do with post-colonial studies. Now, on a side note, if, let's say, you are in Pakistan or India, please do not fall for the trap of nativism. Right? Why, what I mean by that is, and you can also watch or listen to my lecture on nativism, is do not become one of those scholars who say, well, we're not going to read our Foucault and Derrida. They are Western scholars. We are going to just focus on what we have, because that is destructive to your own thought because you are restricting whatever is it that you want to challenge in the world, right? But there are certain things that we need to change. If you have encountered anyone in an English department, even the policies are still colonial policies, right? Insisting that students must know their Shakespeare and must speak a certain way or have a British accent, or write in a British style. Those are colonial legacies, and we can dismantle them. Telling your students that they cannot incorporate an Urdu novel in their English um, dissertation if it is not already translated by someone in the West, right? That is a colonial legacy which needs to be dismantled, right? Higher Education Commission in Pakistan telling universities that the dissertations should be reviewed by someone sitting here in the United States and Canada. That is colonial legacy, right? These are the things that we need to dismantle, right? Or just having this attitude in which people who think that they can speak better in English or have read a few English authors are somehow better than those who do Urdu scholarship or Punjabi scholarship. Those are the colonial legacies that we need to disinherit and dismantle. But there is no harm in reading Western philosophy, so-called, or Western critical thought, because unless you read it, you cannot pose a challenge to it. Similarly, if you don't understand how the global economy works, you cannot think through it and come up with alternatives. So my idea of radical post-coloniality and radical post-colonial scholarship is to know the field, to know the major debates, to know your Foucault, to know your Derrida, right? But not as the last word on thought, but as something that you need to know so that you can mount a critique of it, right? And that critique can be informed by your own cultural ideas, your own philosophies, your own experience. So these are some of my words in this expanded version of my conversation about post-colonialism. I'm pretty sure I've not answered all your questions, but I hope if you watch this or listen to this in concert with my previous work on it, maybe it will give you a slightly more nuanced and better understanding of post-colonialism as a field of study and post-colonialism as we practice it and as it ought to be practiced and how it is developing every single day. That's all. Thank you so much for your time, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.